before everybody is seated, we've, we want to inri- invite, uh, I've never done this part before, I guess the, the land of Facebook or the internet world, uh, we want to welcome you, uh, we want to say how honored we are that you could join us today, but most importantly, we want to encourage you uh, to come and join us on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, uh, we open our word and we have a small group study. And uh, at 10 o'clock, we come together for corporate worship. Uh, As you can tell, I'm not the normal one that's normally here. Brother Brian is away from us here this morning. Uh, We pray for he and and, uh, Sister Tina. We just ask that uh, God watch over them as they are away from us. And uh, welcome. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles, or as I have battled with Savannah from time to time, onto your your phone or your tablet into the book of Hebrews and she's sitting there shaking her head and she's already mad at me to start the day I know you did you told me you were going to as you are turning and getting prepared I want to just take this opportunity to say it has been a long time since I have um, filled the pulpit this pulpit or any other pulpit for that matter um sometimes when you hang around uh, Brother Brian, Brother Brian is going to push you to your limits and he's going to put you in places sometimes where uh, he brings you out of the comfort zone. Uh, I was asked this morning if I was nervous to start the day and I'm like, yeah, not near as much nervous as scared to death and was ready to, to run and get in my truck and leave. Uh, but I told him this morning that as we get closer that the, the nerves calm and, and God has a, a calming hand. I don't know how he does it. I know why he does it, but I don't always understand how how he works. Um, You know, whenever I first started preaching uh, several years ago, and one other thing, I have readers, and if I forget to take them off, and I start looking down to you, somebody bring it up because it'll look like I'm looking down on you over the tops of them. I'm not doing it intentionally. I will try to take them off. Uh, But if I don't have them, I can't read my Bible. So I can see all of you. If I put them on, I can't see Dennis sitting here, and I'll look over the top. I'm not doing it intentionally. Just bear with me on that. Um, But whenever I began to preach many uh, years ago, I started to try to figure out how I could bring my message to where I could reach as many people as possible. When you have a room full of people, you want everybody to be able to relate to something that you uh, have to say. And when you do that you have a tendency to act like the world and you start putting people in groups whether it's by ages or whether it's by uh, whether they're a man or a woman or or rich or poor or whatever like that and and it's not the right thing to do because when you do that you begin to leave people out you're trying to include them but you're leaving them out and God laid on my heart many years ago he said quit doing it he said look at things from my point of view he said there's only two groups of people that we need to worry about and that's the lost and the saved He said, if you start looking at everybody like they are either lost or saved, things get a whole lot smaller, and now you have an easier group to preach to. I don't know that easier is the word that I would choose, but um, since I have done that from time to time, it is easier to realize that when we get rid of looking at people as as to how much money they make or how uh, how old they are or their experiences in life, and we just look at them on the aspect of lost and saved, Uh, God opens the word up a little bit. And I noticed that what God laid on my heart to preach for this, I didn't know exactly which direction he wanted me to go. And when you ask God to help you, you got to be careful. God's going to help you. He's going to blow your mind sometimes. And what he laid on my heart is that even though we, we look at these two small groups of lost people and saved people, there are things in life that everyone, doesn't matter which group you're in, has got to deal with. Three of those things I'm going to mention this morning, and I'm just going to talk very, very briefly about the three of them, and then I'm going to jump to a fourth one. Three of the things that we've got to deal with, whether whether you are lost or saved, is one is Satan, two is the world, and three is the flesh. Three things that, as long as we are walking on this earth, we are going to battle with. Satan is going to deceive you, he's going to cause you doubt, he is going to discourage you, he's going to do everything he can to keep you from the word of God. 
Satan doesn't care if you're rich. He doesn't care if you're young or old. He just does not want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you become a Christian, Satan is going to do everything he can to ruin your testimony. He's going to do everything he can to ruin your witness so that maybe you are ineffective in doing your work for God. The world, on the other hand, the world, they don't care if you're rich or poor as long as you're rich or poor for the world. The world wants you to believe and to follow this system, and if you get out of that system, well, then the world's going to reject you and, and cause you problems. And the flesh is something that we deal with on a daily basis that, I'm sorry, folks, there is nothing that God has that my flesh wants to deal with. My flesh wants the opposite of what God wants for me. And it is three things that whether you are a Christian or whether you are lost that you have to deal with. The good thing about these three things is we are allowed to deal with them while we are on this side of eternity. The one I want to speak of this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and that is death. That scripture says basically that all men are appointed and to die once, and after this the judgment. Two things I want to point out about this, this scripture, about death death that I want to look at number one we're all going to die and number two and what a lot of people don't realize whenever they stop and think about death we have an appointment with it it's an appointment that we don't make it's an appointment that we can't change it's an appointment that folks we're not going to be late for you know um, in the last several years um, I like what doctor's offices, whether it's your vet or whether it's your personal doctor or whatever, you make an appointment and a couple of days before they'll call and say, hey, we want to remind you that you've got a doctor's appointment at 10 a.m. on a certain, certain day. Man, that saves me a lot of trouble sometimes. I don't know if it works for you guys, but it works for me. The only one it doesn't is whenever you're dealing with a dentist, and that's because you put it out there so far in advance. They'll call you a week in advance and say, hey, you have something on the 22nd of get a cleaning, and you think, Man, I've already made plans on the 22nd because that was so long ago. But the thing about these appointments is that we can cancel these appointments, we can change these appointments, we can move these appointments. But we have an appointment with death. The folks, whenever death comes, whether you're ready for it or not, you won't be late. In the almost 30 years that I have, have done my job or, or before that running on the ambulance service, I've, I've dealt with a lot of death and I've seen people meet it in a lot of different ways. Um, I've seen young children, I've seen teenagers, 20, 30, all groups. I've seen the lost, I've seen the saved, I've seen some people fight death. I've seen people fight death up to the last, last point. I've seen people fight me on helping them to fight death. I've seen some people welcome it. I've seen some people know that it's coming in their lives and that they're ready for it. Everybody is going to face it differently. Everybody is going to react to it differently. But the thing I want you to remember here this morning is you do have an appointment with death. Now, the, the part about this sermon here that I'm, I'm speaking about is I could probably preach this in any church, any mosque, any temple around the world. Atheists know we're going to die. Muslims know that we're going to die. Hindu, Buddhists, it doesn't matter. Wherever you go, no one's going to argue with the fact that we're going to die. Now, some may say, well, everybody's going to live a long life, and, and well, no, that's not guaranteed. No one's guaranteed tomorrow. But nobody's going to argue the point that we're going to die. It's the next part of this verse that a lot of people are going to argue with, and that we're going to start having problems with other people. And that's the judgment aspect of it, because nobody wants to be judged. And whenever we look at it from the aspect of 
There's only two groups of people, the lost and saved, and after this there is the judgment. We have two different judgments that I want to look at just very briefly here this morning. The first one is found in 2 Corinthians, and you don't have to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, And for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it is good or bad. Now, that judgment seat is referring specifically towards Christians. That judgment seat of Christ right there is sometimes referred to the, the Bema judgment seat. And yes, as Christians, we will once, one day stand before God or kneel before God in, in judgment for the things that we've done while we were a Christian. For all the things that he asked us to do that we didn't do, for all the things that he asked us to do that we did do, for the things he didn't have to ask us to do that we did do. We are going to be judged on whether we brought glory to his name or we turned a blind eye to his work we will stand in judgment. But at this judgment, the Christian is not in fear of losing his salvation. His salvation has already been decided. I'd like to say that everybody in here today will, will be at that judgment. I don't know that. I can't be assured of that. But it's the second judgment that I want to look at just a little bit longer today that I wanted to get to a little quicker. And that's found in Revelations chapter 20. And this is a little bit longer reading, so just bear with me. And this is referred to as the great white throne judgment. And in chapter, 11, or in chapter 20, verse 11, it says, And then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, in whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And anyone not found written into the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's a scary judgment, folks. That is a judgment that will happen at the end of time. That God is doing away with all sin for all of those who decided that they wanted to reject God throughout their life that when they died they never had another opportunity that their fate was sealed and that you are going to spend an eternity in the absence of the Lord when you read in some of the gospels and other part of the, the books we get some descriptions of of hell and as bad as it may be I think the worst aspect of the whole part of hell is not being in the presence of God and knowing that we had an opportunity to come to Christ Jesus many of us according to the Bible are going to stand before Christ on that day at the great white throne judgment. And many of us are going to stand in front of him. And many of them are going to be belligerent. They're probably going to curse at him. They're probably going to realize, I didn't want to have anything to do with him on earth. I don't want anything to do with you now. And there's going to be a lot of people who go to church every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, and attend the Bible studies that are going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And yeah, you was a church member, but you really weren't a Christian. You never did surrender your life to Jesus. And he's going to open these books. And he's going to judge you much in the same manner that he's probably going to judge a, a Christian. He's going to look at your life. 
But there's one other important book there that has got your name in it or doesn't have your name in it. And if you're not found written in the Lamb's book of life, it doesn't matter what else you've done on earth. It doesn't matter all the good that you've done for people. It doesn't matter what you thought about God or what you thought about religion or what you thought about anything. And there's going to be a lot of people that's going to beg in that day. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did I not cast out demons? And Lord, Lord, did I not do this? He's just going to simply look at him and say, you know what, I never knew you. And hell is a place that was only created for the devil and his angels. That was never created for us. It was never created for mankind. But the Bible also says that we have people around us that are dying every day that are breaking the gates of hell wide open. And the bad thing about that, and, and sometimes it's our fault, is that they don't have to. And I say that it's our fault because sometimes we're not carrying the gospel, the good news, to those who need it most. An eternity without... Christ's love an eternity without a loving God I've tried many a times to wrap my head around eternity and you know those things that try to figure things out and I you know you just can't our finite minds just cannot understand what it's like for God to have always existed for the Son to have always existed for the Holy Spirit to have always existed even before the foundations of the world, they existed. And to understand that there will come a time when time no longer matters. But like I said, I do have good news. And that good news is none other than Jesus Christ. Do you know that with every ounce of scripture that you go over and when you study it you begin to see that it is nothing more than love letters from God written for us to us in his attempt to reach out to us to say hey you know what I love you and I want you to be with me I heard a preacher say one time that, and it's another one of those things that we don't understand God wants us in heaven more than we want to be in heaven So if you're asking the question, well, how do I not be at the white throne judgment? Trust in Jesus. Come to Jesus. Call upon his name. The Bible tells us that God doesn't want any to perish. That he wants us all to come to the knowledge of righteousness or repentance. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That scripture you read this morning, it amazes me sometimes whenever you prepare something and somebody gets up here and reads something that you, you didn't work it out with them. And it's just confirmation. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Most famous scripture in the Bible says that God for so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life and Jesus goes on to say I didn't come to the world to condemn the world I came so that the world might be saved through me Jesus told his followers he said I am the way the truth and the life and that no one gets to the father except through me he said such things as my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in your weakness Paul reminds us that Jesus is a gift of God. Nothing that we've done, but it's a gift that we just have to receive it. 
Jesus told his followers, he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then one of these days, I'm going to come back and get you. And I wouldn't be telling you this if I wasn't going to do it. That's what he's saying. He said, I'm going to go to the Father. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then one of these days, you can come and you can be with me and the Father for the rest of eternity. What other man do you know that at the time of his execution is crying out to the Father, forgive him, because they don't know what they're doing. He wasn't talking about the Roman soldiers and the and the and the the Sanhedrin and the priests that were there screaming and hollering at you. He was talking about me and you. He was talking about our sins that was putting him on that cross. And he asked his father to forgive him. Forgive us. Because we don't understand what we're doing when we sin. Verse after verse after verse of God reaching out to us. Jesus' own words stating the love that he has for us. So this morning you have a couple of choices. Maybe you are a Christian and you're dealing with Satan. Maybe you're dealing with the world right now. Maybe you're battling your own flesh. If you're a Christian, the good news is is that you know who can help you. Most of the time we try to do it on our own. If you're lost, you're here today and you're dealing with those three things, I want to introduce you to somebody and his name's Jesus. But every day that I go and pick up a newspaper, you can go to the back page and you can see that there's the names of those who were here just a few days ago, and now they're not. Many of them, when you get to look, and probably had plans for later in the week. Maybe they're already making plans for their summer vacation. Maybe they're making plans for what they're going to do for the next few years of their life. And yet they had an appointment that they didn't know about. I believe that was an appointment that God had made long before he laid the foundations of the world. He knew whenever we were going to be born and he knew us whenever we were going to die. And if you die here today, tomorrow, or next week and you don't know Jesus Christ, I can promise you one thing is that one of these days you will stand in front of him and you're going to beg, borrow him, plead everything you can but your fate will have already been sealed Jesus has given us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity while we're here alive but too many of us don't stop and realize that death is final I wish there were some young kids even younger than these guys and Avery You know, a lot of times, things that they're seeing in the world today and the video games they're playing, death isn't permanent. You push a button and you start all over again. And you may die in this movie and we're going to bring you back in the next movie. We don't take death serious enough. For the Christian, it is a time to rejoice because that person has never been more alive than they are right now being in the presence of Christ it tells us to be absent from the bodies to be in the presence of the Lord but yet if we die and we don't know him the opposite holds true to be absent from the body is to be in the absence of the Lord and that's an eternal eternal judgment and it's not a judgment it's not a decision that Jesus is making it's a decision that we are making here today while we've been given precious time. So I ask you here today, 
Do you know which judgment you're going to go? If you walk out these doors and you're not here next Sunday, if we're reading your name at the back of the newspaper this week, do you know which judgment you're going to face at the end of time? Is it going to be the one where Jesus is still going to, you're going to receive some loss and you're going to receive some rewards for the actions that you've done for him? But yet, he's still going to tell you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in. Or are you going to stand before him at what is referred as the great white throne judgment? When I read this, I almost at times think that we'll have our heads bowed. We won't even be able to look at Christ for those who are standing in front of him. And we will lay out our case and we'll beg and we will plead. And he will reject us because we rejected him. So I'm going to ask at this time, I'm just going to ask everybody to just bow their heads, close their eyes. And if you're a Christian here today, I'm going to ask you, number one, to thank God for saving your soul. And number two, I'm going to ask you that you, I know that you know somebody in your life that is not a Christian. I know that whether it's a child, whether it's your spouse, whether it is your parents, a co-worker, a neighbor, best friend, I know that you've got somebody in your life today that doesn't know Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to just pray for them. I'm going to ask you to just lift them up to God. That God starts dealing with their sin and in their hearts and in their lives. And if you're here today and you know that if you weren't going to be here next week with us, and yet you think you're not sure which judgment you're going to be facing. If you're here today and you just aren't sure, or you're pretty sure that you know which one you're going to be at, and you don't want to be at that one, I'm going to ask you to come. Purify my heart Let me be as gold And precious silver Purify my heart Let me be as gold Pure gold Refiner's fire is to be holy set apart for you Lord I choose to be holy set apart for you my master me from within and make me holy purify my heart cleanse me from my sin deep within refiner's fire my heart's one desire to be holy, say.